Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm here uh, to talk to you all about um, monitoring is up, now what? Um, I'm Frederick, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Polar Signals. We're an early start stage startup um, and we're kind of still in stealth mode. So if you're uh, interested in being the first one to know what's gonna happen, what we're working on, uh, head over to our website and sign up for our, um, for our newsletter. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter uh, to, to see when we do the announcements. But um, in terms of monitoring um, and observability, I've been working on observability, all things observability for the past five years. Um, I am a Prometheus maintainer. I maintain parts of Kubernetes that uh, concern observability. Um, I'm, and I'm uh, involved in many other observability products uh, and projects out there in open source. Excuse me, but, um, uh, there is yeah, quite a bunch of background uh, background noise or like some sort of, you know, distorted uh, uh, noise. From the, I don't know if it's from the headphone or something like that. Is this better? Yeah, slightly better. Okay. Should I uh, start over or? Oh, no, no, this is not better. <laughs> this is uh, this is also having the same kind of okay. distortion. Is it is it like some sort of headset or your microphone? It's an external microphone. I typically don't have problems with it. Strange. How about now? Yeah, I think we can go with it. it. Yeah, it's not super clear, but that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, hopefully, it'll hopefully it'll get better. Um, okay. Where did I leave off? Um, so yeah, t today we're uh, going to talk about the scenario where. Um, we may have just set up our new shiny monitoring system now that maybe Prometheus, um, I certainly as a Prometheus maintainer would recommend that, but um, everything that I'm going to be talking about today, um, while the concrete examples are going to be about Prometheus, um, they're uh, relatively transferable to any other monitoring system out there. Um, really, this is intended to be kind of general type of advice um, on how to best do monitoring. And um, when I talk about monitoring today, um, as we've already seen in our previous talk, uh, there's a lot um, concerned with um, observability, and monitoring is only part of that. Um, so when I talk about monitoring today, I really am talking about mainly metrics. And generally speaking, um, metrics con uh, are concerned about time series. So those are samples collected over time. Um, and written to some time series database. Um, that can be push or pull. Uh, I won't get into that uh, discussion today. Um, obviously, Prometheus is a pull-based uh, monitoring system. It kind of pulls the metrics uh, from an HTTP endpoint and writes those to its internal time series database. Um, but there may you may already be using a monitoring system uh, that uses push. Um, but the whole point is, these are samples that are collected over time and written to a time series database. And then typically there's some query language to be able make, to make sense of this data, right? In the case of Prometheus, we have our wonderful PromQL language. Um, and one thing that may be unique to Prometheus that we will see a couple of times, but um, many other monitoring systems out there do the same thing, is that time series are uniquely identified by their set of labels. So what we see here, for example, um, uh, an example of a HTTP request total 
um, time series, it has this label code 200, right? And that combination um, of the metric name and the labels uniquely identifies this, uh, this time series. Um, and this is how we can kind of select which time series we're actually interested in when we, when we query. But let's go back um, to, to our general advice um, now that we've kind of set the scene. Um, when, we, when we are looking for advice on the internet, um, either you've already uh, kind of read this book or seen this book, or if you're going to go on this journey, you're most likely going to be hearing about this book. This is commonly referred to as the Google SRE book. Um, and while I think uh, you should all probably read this, um, I think there's a lot of great advice in here. Uh, we also need to keep in mind that we're all not uh, necessarily uh, Google scale. So a lot of what's written in here is really great for a Google scale, scale company, um, but may not work at, at your scale. It's most likely that you're probably not at Google scale. That said, uh, there's still a lot of really great advice in these books, so I do recommend everybody to read them, but take all the advice kind of with a grain of salt. Um, so when we start with monitoring, um, obviously we have the data that we talked about, but what can we actually do in terms of useful things with this data? Um, essentially, why do we even do monitoring, right? Um, first and foremost, uh, and I think this is the most valuable thing that you can do with this data, is alerting. So the ability to say whether our systems are actually doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. Um, and then there are various other things that we can see here um, that this data can be used for. But I personally think alerting is the most um, effective and most valuable thing that you can do with it. So that's why today I want to be focused on a focus on alerting aspects the most. Um, as I said, all of these other things are also useful, but I think the most useful is alerting because we can have a bunch of data for debugging or for experiments or for capacity planning, but if we don't know whether our applications are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, well, then why are we doing all of this, right? Um, and uh, this is something uh, I really uh, kind of felt the previous talk also got, got really right, um, which is focusing on the user's experience when you're doing all of this. At the end of the day, we're doing, like probably we're doing none of this just for the fun of it, but probably because um, either we make money with the systems that we're monitoring or we're somehow supporting someone else in making money with, with the systems that we're, uh, that we're running, right? Um, so, and at the end of the day, we want to maximize that. And that's kind of why we're doing all of this, right? And we need to figure out what, uh, what is it that we can measure uh, that kind of shows our success in, in, in all of this. And ultimately, we then also need to figure out, is this actually that important that we need to spend this, this much time on all of this? Um, that is not to say you shouldn't monitor all your systems. You definitely should. But um, to what degree you invest in all of this should de definitely depend on the importance um, of, the, of the thing that you're monitoring. So for example, if this is the thing that your company makes money with, well, then it's very likely that you're going to want to spend a lot of time on, um, on your monitoring set setup for this because you do want to know, you do want to be able to measure how well are our users actually experiencing our product, right? And so um, as you go down this path, uh, this, uh, this uh, kind of mantra probably is something that you're going to encounter, which is called symptoms versus, symptom versus cause-based uh, alerting. And I found that people who are only starting with their journey in monitoring um, often kind of uh, aren't sure what this really means, or they've seen it and they repeat it, but they, they're not really practicing it uh, in the way um, that it's meant. And uh, this is where, again, I want to go back to um, being user focused. And what is it that our users are experiencing? And this is really the symptoms of our system, right? Um, if our services aren't re responding in the way that they're supposed to, if, they, if the latency is higher than we expect it to be, those are symptoms of our system. 
whereas um, a cost based alert um, is essentially is the thing that we want to avoid so this could be um, uh, a process is crashing for example now that while that's not necessarily a good thing, as long as our users aren't actually experiencing any of this, um, it may not be worth um, alerting on, right? We want to know that our users are actually experiencing our service in the best possible way. If the rest of our infrastructure is actually rely reliable enough to not have to care about this one process crashing, well, then we shouldn't be alerting on it. Our, our users are still experiencing everything um, in, in the expected way. Um, and while all of this is really great advice, right, um, and most of you probably have heard all of this already, um, this really becomes difficult when we actually want to do these things, right? So sure, we've heard all of these things maybe before, but how do we actually implement them? Um, and here's where I always say start super simple. Start with the simplest possible thing that you can do. And for most of you, uh, for most of you, this is probably completely obvious that you should be doing this, but so many people skip on this and go right to the really complicated solutions where um, really starting with like synthetic monitoring where some service does a ping against your service every now and then um, is really something super valuable that has really a really low threshold of getting started with that nobody should be skipping over this. Um, so synthetic uh, monitoring or black box probes, um, there are various names for this. Um, it's kind of the easiest way to simulate your user's experience, right? You do a ping um, and you get, you expect some result from that back and you can also measure the latency of that. Um, so this is really simple to get started with. On the contrary though, um, because we're, uh, we're potentially, let's say, to doing a ping from Australia to our service in, uh, in the US, there's a lot of network um, equipment in between that may not have anything to do with your service, right? So um, you may actually be measuring errors of things that are not your system. So you, you do wanna know about those things, but it's important to distinguish um, and know about the capabilities of these kinds of synthetic probes. So you want to definitely do geographically distributed ones, um, and you want to know the limitations of these things. But I still recommend this is the very first thing that you should implement when you start on your monitoring journey. And once you've done that, we can go into some of the um, like deeper understandings of our systems, which we typically refer to as white box monitoring. Um, that's kind of the counterpart to black box monitoring, right? Black box monitoring is the um, observing our system as a whole from the outside um, and just seeing what kind of interact, whether the interactions with the system are what we expect. Whereas white box monitoring is actually measuring the, the, the process measuring itself and what it's doing. And this becomes extremely powerful because we can measure whether the application then is actually internally even doing the things that we're expecting it to do, uh, not just from kind of inputs and outputs in this black box, um, but we can actually deeply understand what it's doing. And here, I think the Google SRE book has some really great advice. Um, they refer to uh, kind of when, you, when you're just starting out with monitoring and uh, you're, you're looking for what to do first, these four golden signals, as they call it, um, are the place to start. And um, typically, these are meant for network services, like HTTP services, but they tend to be relatively easily adaptable to most other types of applications. Um, maybe not batch um, kind of processes, um, but it's still a lot of these things still do apply. So latency, I think, is kind of an obvious one. How fast does it? Uh, how long does it take for us to serve a request that our user issues against us, right? Um, because, well, we want to be able to t uh, to say all our users are, or 99.9% .9 of our requests are actually served within 100 milliseconds or something like that. Um, and to be able to tell any of that, we actually need to measure the traffic, right? How many uh, requests am I actually getting um, per second, for example, or per minute or per hour? 
Um, and then out of all of these requests, um, how many are erroring? Um, because what's a request worth if it's actually erroring but fast, right? We don't really um, care about fast requests when they're erroring. We only care about the latency of requests that are not erroring because, well, they're serving their purpose. Um, and then saturation, I think, is probably uh, the hardest one to get right. Um, essentially, saturation means how full is my service. This is this we can uh, tell relatively um, easily with databases, for example, which are connected with hard drives. We can say, okay, my hard drive of this database, this database is going to be full um, in so many days potentially. But uh, that's kind of hard to say with a plain HTTP service, right? So here, uh, the recommendation tends to be do some load tests in your CI infrastructure um, and then use that as a threshold. But um, I personally tend to use um, kind of a proxy metric for that, where especially for HTTP services where saturation is just, well, if, I, if I'm running out of CPU, then my latency becomes higher. And so I tend to just measure the latency um, to, to know uh, when, my, when, when I'm saturating my services. And then I scale up my services, and the latency hopefully goes down again. Um, but the point is, these four golden, golden signals, um, if you have nothing, start with these, because they're going to be so valuable um, that you may not even need to instrument a whole lot of other things. Um, or at least these are going to catch most of the user's experience. And when you're getting started with this, um, histograms are your friend, because histograms um, are used to measure latency, right? And if you create a histogram per endpoint and per um, response code, well, then you are measuring your latency. Because histograms are cumulative, right? They're counting how many requests are taking how a certain amount of time. Um, well, adding up all of those buckets means that you also have the count of all of your traffic. And if you're splitting it out by response code as well, well, then you're also measuring your errors. And just like that, we've Im implemented all of these golden signals um, just with one histogram. And um, that's why this is so powerful. If, so if you're starting out um, and you don't know what to do, um, just start with adding histograms to your HTTP endpoints, and you're going to have um, almost all the insight uh, that you're going to need in terms of understanding how your users are experiencing your service. Um, there's a whole lot of other things that I could say about this. Um, I recommend you, if you're inter interested in understanding this even more deeply, uh, there's a really fantastic talk, talk by Bjorn um, at KubeCon. Uh, I highly recommend watch, you watching this if you're more interested in uh, why histograms are really awesome. Um, and finally, and we heard this in our previous talk as well, um, once you've kind of added um, synthetic probes, once you've started instrumenting your um, applications with your most valuable um, metrics, well, we actually need to then set ourselves some goals of uh, that we actually need to achieve, right? But the very first thing that we should be asking ourselves is, do, do we really have to have a goal for this? Does, it, does the service really matter that much? Um, and I, I keep repeating this throughout this talk because I tend to, uh, I've seen many t uh, time and time again that people just set arbitrary goals for services that don't matter and then stress out about um, them not need, need, uh, reaching their goals or nobody doing anything if they're not reaching their goals. These are all things that you do need to keep in mind when you do implement um, service level objectives. And uh, once you've done that, once you've figured out what happens when we're not reaching our SLO, that could, what uh, a consequence of that could mean we're not doing any more feature development, we're only uh, going to be um, investing time on stability of our system for, let's say, two weeks or until we uh, are back in our targeted goal. Um, if these are all things that you have figured out, and this is something that um, probably 
that tends to be done best on a case-by-case -case basis within an organization, well, then you can go into the technicalities of SLOs. Um, and most important here is figuring out what you're actually kind of be measuring here, right? So those are uh, referred to as service level indicators. Um, so our errors or our latency tend to be the, the things that we use as our indicators. And then, of course, we need to define our availability target, like things that we've seen before. Let's say 99.9% .9 of all requests should be served without any errors. That's the example that we saw in our previous talk as well. Um, and the reason why we're setting, all, uh, setting these targets, um, the biggest reason uh, why I think uh, service level objectives are really useful and all the alerting that I'm going to be showing in a second um, is really useful is so that we can have a really clear definition of what we are going to be alerting on and what um, we can safely ignore. Because context switches uh, when we're working are, are difficult, right? Uh, they're costly um, and we don't wanna waste anybody's time uh, to look at an incident that may not even matter at all, right? Maybe it's not even an incident, that's the whole point. How do we distinguish that? So the the easiest example uh, that we could start out with is our SLI being our HTTP requests total. And as we saw earlier, we're measuring both um, all our traffic with this as well as our errors. And we're saying our target being we uh, want to serve 99.9% .9 of all requests without errors. What that, um, and we need to always um, specify a window as well. So our window in this case is 30 days. And within 30 days, 99.9% .9 of all requests being served without errors means that for an entire 43 minutes and 11 seconds, we could be serving 100% of errors, OK? So that's really important to keep in mind. And then our simplest possible query to measure how many requests, how many errors are happening right at this moment in time, or rather within the last five minutes, um, could be this query. Now, if you've done something like this before, then you probably already know what's going to happen here, which is these kind of um, queries tend to be really noisy because they're not actually taking into account um, this entire 30-day window. We're only looking at the past five minutes. And if, we're if we as I mentioned before, we can spend an entire 43 minutes um, serving 100% of errors. So if we're only uh, erroring 0.1% of the time throughout the entire month, we're still reaching our goal. And so this is where error budgets uh, come in. And error budgets really depend on your um, availability target, right? And this is where we can quickly see the higher availability that we're targeting, um, exponentially more expensive it is to actually hit this target. So with 99.9%, .9 we have uh, we can have 43 minutes of um, total downtime. Down with 99.99, uh, .99, we only have four minutes. And with five nines, we have 25 seconds only. So that's um, really important to, to remember uh, because what we saw earlier is we, we shouldn't actually be alerting on the error rate at this uh, particular moment, moment in time, but we, we should be looking at all the possible errors that we can serve in total. And this is what we um, refer to as error budgets. So the total amount of errors that we're allowed to serve within the 30-day window. And um, there's a really great section in the, in the second Google SRE book, which is the Google SRE workbook, um, that uh, spends a lot of time on uh, kind of the mathematics behind this. But the, um, this simple theory here essentially is, let's not look at error rates at this particular moment in time, but let's look at how fast we're burning our error budget. So the total amount of errors that we are allowed to serve. Right, and here we can quickly see if we're burning at if we're burning uh, at a rate of one, so 0.1 percent of errors, we can actually not care about this throughout the entire time of our 30-day window because we're still going to be reaching our goal. 
That is, um, if we're not burning higher at a rate higher than one. Now, if we're burning at a rate of two, we're going to be running out of our budget uh, in 15 days. So this is something we would potentially want to look at quicker. And so um, this is what we need to um, need to kind of think about a bit more. And I, I want to go back one more thing, one more time to the thing that I said earlier, which is we want to make sure that the alerts that we do define and that do interrupt someone um, are definitely not false positives, right? And so a methodology that was described in the Google SRE workbook here is that um, you use multiple burn rates to determine whether you're actually going to be running out of error budget. And so you say um, over the past six hours and over the past three days, um, our predictions say we are going to be running out of um, error budget. What that causes is that momentary spikes in, um, in errors um, can potentially be ignored if they're not going to cause us to run out of our total error budget available. Um, and so this is how we can create the most useful, in my experience, um, alerts that are definitely um, true incidents um, and not too noisy. Um, they tend to be um, exactly the right balance in my experience. And so I have brought a real example here of, um, of an alert that I've implemented in the past um, where we're looking at our six hour burn rate as well as our three day burn rate. So we're looking back at the last six hours of data as well as the last three days of data. Um, and if for three hours at a time, the burn rates for these two windows have been larger than uh, one, that's when we're actually going to start, um, start firing. But this burn rate is actually still low enough that I don't necessarily need to wake up someone. Someone just eventually needs to have a look at this because we're only burning at our rate one, right? So keep in mind that that means we're still going to be uh, just making our target um, even though there are some errors in our system. But this is high enough that someone should have a look at it eventually. And um, we can essentially increase the severity of this. Um, notice the small change in numbers here. Um, we can, as the intensity of our burn rate increases essentially, um, the faster we're going to be um, notifying people about this. Um, so here we're going to look, be looking at a burn rate of six, right, um, over the last 30 minutes and six hours. So these are shorter time windows, which essentially means we're burning our uh, error budget more quickly. Um, so this is a situation where we may actually already want to page someone and potentially even wake up someone uh, during the night because it means we are going to be running. It looks like we are going to be running out, out of error budget, which consequently would mean we are not going to be um, hitting our goal, essentially. And uh, we can kind of go further with this. And uh, the higher the burn rate, the faster we, um, we page people. And that's essentially how I've experienced SLOs to have worked best in the past. Um, so that where you look at multiple windows at the same time and focus on error budget as opposed to momentary um, spikes in, in errors, for example. This is, this is in, in my experience, been the most effective. Um, and I, I, I didn't expect anybody to take any notes with this. I uh, kind of intentionally went uh, relatively fast over these rules because there are some really uh, incredible tools out there. This one in particular was written by one of my ex-coworkers, um, Matthias Leube. Um, and uh, you can essentially go to this website and it'll generate Prometheus rules for you um, with a particular availability target that you're setting. And you can configure the SLIs that you're interested in and it'll just generate the rules that I've just shown essentially. Uh, so this is a really powerful resource I've found um, for implementing SLOs. But to recap our entire talk now, um, start small. Start with synthetic probes um, and black box 
probe or black box probes, whatever your system calls them. Um, and when you when you're just starting out, make sure that you start out with a good foundation of metrics. Um, so make sure that you have those histograms because they're so useful, so powerful, and give you basically all the data that you need to evaluate whether your users are experiencing the service, your service in the way that you're expecting. And when you really have identified you do need to um, implement SLOs, um, make sure that you have all the kind of non-technical aspects figured out first as well. Um, that would be an entire separate talk, but I uh, highly recommend you um, to read up on that as well. But then on the technical side of things, um, go through um, multi-error uh, budget burn rates um, and look at error rates and latencies first. So that's pretty much all I have for you today. Um, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask them now, uh, but also feel free to uh, tweet at me or write me an email, and I'd be happy to chat. Thank you.